graphic. And let me just let it run for a few seconds. All right, uh, whenever you're ready, just give me a three, two, one countdown. Okay. <clears throat> Five, four, three, two. Today is August 12th, 2013. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Bad Communication Podcast. From Nishinomiya, between Kobe and Osaka, I am Andrew Hawkins. And coming at you live from Tokushima, my name is Hiroki Matsuchi. Uh, and t- uh, you can take it if you want. <laughs> and today, it's the Obon Short Show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so today is the first day of the uh, Obon holiday, for me at least. I know, Andrew, you said you've got to work. Sorry about that. I've had a couple of days. I've had the last three days off, actually. Yeah, you've been kind of living it up at Summer Sonic for the past couple of days. Just mm-hmm. got back from that. Braving like, the crowds and the dirt and the heat. I, I remember last year you, um, well, I mean, obviously there are quite a few highlights, but you, uh, you were pretty kind of keen on that um it was the silent dj or like silent rave thing. oh the silent disco did they have that again this year they had it again but we didn't go inside oh that's um, too bad by the time when at the time we walked past it it was full they weren't letting people in yeah it was kind of a cool idea it was like it was one one you described it was like one big room a couple different djs all playing music that were broadcast to wireless headphones on different right. channels right right so you'd see like this completely silent room with people raving out to completely different music, well, right? You'd hear this. You'd hear the noises of people stomping and people singing, to, to com- cheering. Completely different beats and tempos, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you you kind of posted your uh, your rundown, your uh, impression of the right. uh, of the uh, concert on Google Plus, Facebook. Yeah. I mean, so what were the uh, what were the highlights? Oh uh, man. Well, I think the best performance was Muse. Um, just aside from being great musicians, they put on a huge, a great stage show. Yeah, you you mentioned like giant robots on the stage. Yeah, there something? was this one part where they did kind of a. It wasn't a song; it was a segue, <laughs> and they they played kind of a dubstep track. They had these custom guitars and basses with uh, cost controllers on them, uh-huh. which is a kind of a touchpad synth. And they played dubstep, and there was this gigantic robot that came out on the stage. Is it a dubstepping robot? No, it was it. Its legs didn't move. It just moved its arms. <laughs> That's but pretty the guy cool. Didn't dance. Uh, how was the like absurd heat that you had at Summer Sonic? Uh, well, this I found this year, as in previous years, the more you sweat, the less you have to use the toilet. And it can't be very good for your kidneys. That that is true. I guess it's uh kind of the amount of water that comes in probably equals about the amount of water that goes out. Yeah. Do they have those like um those Mister things? kind of spread around the the concert ground they do uh but i i find those don't help me out too much <laughs> okay oh, just cool. f- freeze a couple bottles of water and carry them around and it should last you till about 5 p.m at which point then maybe you have to buy something from a vendor yeah i, I remember a couple of years ago you invited me to uh summer sonic and I, it sounds really cool you know i'm not a huge music fan i mean I'm not as into music as you are, but it sounded like a great experience. It's just the heat and the crowd. I don't know how well I do. Yeah, the, the, the August heat is... This year was particularly bad. Last year, there were thunderstorms, yeah. which was crazy in its own right. <laughs> I can imagine giant giant tubular steel frame stages in an yeah. electrical storm. It's probably not. <laughs> well, they, they had to cancel a few performances because of it, or they had to stop a few of them. Right, right, yeah, I think in you mentioned between. that. I think, I think Perfume was performing at the time, and they had to shut it down. Cool. Because uh, they don't want to have three fried J-pop girls <laughs> on, their, on their record. Yeah, no, probably not good for insurance either. Well, anyway, you made it next year, Summer Sonic 2014, right? Maybe. I don't know. This this year's lineup wasn't so intriguing to me, but there were some good shows. But it was Metallica, right? You know, I'm not. They they rock hard for a bunch of middle aged dudes, but I'm not a Metallica fan. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll I'll give them credit where it's due, but I left early to beat <laughs> the crowds during their show. Right. Right. Oh, cool. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Needless to say, guys, um, Alex uh, unfortunately cannot be joining us. He's uh, I think it's day three of Comic Ed. Um, which is kind of like, a, it's one of the big things that he does every year. Uh, it's funny, actually, I read an interesting article about a, uh, uh, an office worker who worked in a building adjacent to, uh, 
I forgot the venue. It's not Makahari Messe. Well, anyway, the uh, Comic Ed venue, he, uh, he sent like a, a letter of complaint to the organizers of the event, um, commenting on the tremendous stench <laughs> that was coming. Wow. From the, uh, yeah, from the, uh, the venue. The stench from Summer Sonic was pretty bad, too. Was it? Well, I mean, there's always this kind of, like, I guess, stigma of, you know, comic nerds and figure nerds gathering in a convention center being a little bit more smelly than your average uh, convention goers. But Perhaps. Yeah, well, it is indoors, and I guess uh, Summer Sonic is outside. Um, yeah, so anyway, guys, uh, we are going to have a little bit of a short show because we want to get the hell out of here as soon as possible. We've got stuff to do, um, and uh, for me, that includes uh, enjoying my Obon holiday. <laughs> Um, but for those of you guys who don't know, Obon is, um, I always kind of laugh when people say it's like Halloween, um, because it's really nothing like Halloween, but I guess the core principle is about the same. It's kind of, um, a celebration of the dead or a remembrance of your ancestors. Right. Um, but I mean, beyond that, there's no trick or treating, no candy. It's just a chance to, uh, kind of visit your family graves, visit your family's, um, you know, living family. Um, and there are all sorts of really fun festivals. Tokushima, there's a really huge dance festival called the Awa Odori. Uh, check it out if you guys are in Japan during Obon, which is in August. All right, so we do have a few stories. Um, the biggest one that was kind of all over the news uh, this past week um, was the earthquake. Uh, so, yeah, there was, a, there was an earthquake in Wakayama, which is in the eastern, sorry, western part of Japan. Uh, however, uh, via a nationwide alert system that uh, is kind of run... Uh, in conjunction with the Medi Japan Meteorological Agency, as well as a lot of the cell phone carriers in Japan, there was this um, alert sent out to every single cell phone, almost without exception in Japan. Um, smartphones, feature phones, pretty much anything that can pick up a cellular signal. Did you get, you got the alert, didn't you? I did, actually. Did it scare the crap out of you like it scared the crap out of me? No, I, my phone was uh, in, in another room to charge. Uh -huh. I was at work. And I left my phone charging in one room, and I went into another one. And then my coworker comes in and says, "Hey, your phone's earthquake alarm just went off." I was like, "What, really?" <laughs> okay, so so what happened? This is kind of an interesting story. Um, last Thursday, a little bit before 5 p.m., um, pretty much all of this, every single, almost every single cell phone in Japan um, started emitting this noise that most people had never heard before. Um, for me, it's kind of like a beep, 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 beep. It's a terrifying noise, and the first thing you think of is oh my god, there's an earthquake coming. Um, and usually these alerts are set to go off if it's going to be uh, relatively severe shaking above uh, Shindo 3, I think. Um, however, it wasn't just kind of localized to one area. It was actually broadcast to all phones all over Japan um, because what they thought uh, was actually a really large earthquake, I think magnitude 7.8 on the Richter scale, was actually uh, an incredibly small magnitude 2.3 earthquake in Wakayama. And it, actually, the, the reason behind this was uh, just, it was a freak occurrence, essentially. Um, underneath the, uh, the sea floor, or underneath the, uh, it, on the sea floor, there are all of these seismic sensors. And apparently these seismic sensors, sensors they experience just noise um, in their readings. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, when this relatively small 2.3 earthquake was triggered, <clears throat> uh, one of the sensors actually uh, registered a one centimeter shift in the seafloor, which doesn't sound like that much, but it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, and it was, just, it was just a coincidence, or so the meteorological agency says. And uh, because of these two occurrences happening about at the same time, it registered it as a 7.8, 7 I think, above magnitude 7. Well, it was ridiculous because, like, uh, as I was saying, I was working in Sakai, which is in uh, South Osaka. Right. I, I picked up my phone and it said 7.8 Nara Prefecture, which is just the next prefecture over. Right. It says, please prepare for strong shaking. And I was thinking, like, what the heck is going on here? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, like so I don't feel anything. Did you feel anything? So I got the alert. Um, I, I looked at my phone. It said Nara Prefecture, 7.8. And I was like, holy crap, this is going to be big. There's going to be a lot of shaking. It's going to happen. I mean, the alert usually comes about one second, maybe mm -hmm. two seconds, three seconds before the actual quake. So I kind of I panicked a little bit. Um, I stood up. I was like, oh, my God, I'm in a concrete building. It's not reinforced. I got to get the hell out of here. So I ran down the stairs outside. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm underneath a bunch of power lines. I got to get the <laughs> hell out of here. So I ran into the park, uh, which was about, you know, two minutes after the, uh, the alarm came. 
And I was just, I was sitting out there waiting for this big quake, this big tremor to happen. And uh, yeah, nothing, which is pretty weird. It was just a glitch and the, uh, the meteorological agency apologized profusely for it. I think we've been punked. We have. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like, it wasn't just one region. It was literally the entire nation of Japan got punked. They freaked out when this uh, earthquake alarm went off. I, I remember reading some funny posts, like some dude was in the, um, the Apple store in, uh, was it Shinsai Bashi? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, when the quake alert went out, like every single device, like hundreds of devices in the Apple store all started making this horrible earthquake alert sound. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, be wary of earthquakes, but also be wary of uh, false alarms. Anyway, why don't we jump to the next story? Yes, we've got big computers simulating big things. Mm -hmm. In this case, the K computer, the built by Fujitsu out in Kobe, was simulating 1% one, 1 of brain activity in a human brain. This is kind of interesting um, because I, I read this from somebody who's actually somewhat involved in the, pro in the uh, project to some capacity. So what exactly is the uh, K computer? The K computer is a, it's a 8.62, hold on a second, 8.162 petaflop supercomputer. And what is a petaflop, you may ask? Well, it's one quadrillion floating point, um, floating logic point. Ah, operations. <laughs> operations per second. Per second, right. It's really fast. A floating point operations, flop. Right. It's super fast um, and it's super big. It's but it took them 40 minutes to simulate 1% of the brain activity of a human. Yeah, so... It was, which kind of shows how complex the human brain is and how huge the whole thing is. Yeah, so this computer is one of the uh, top 10 fastest computers in the world. It's not the yeah. fastest one. Um, not anymore. It used to be. Right. Um, so, yeah, as Andrew said, it simulated 1% of human brain activity. Um, but the amazing thing is it simulated 1% of human brain activity for one second. So, <laughs> and it took 40 minutes. To and it so. took 40 minutes of processing. So, right. <clears throat> um, you know, it, well, it's really interesting. So I've, I've read a few um, kind of interesting articles about the supercomputing. And at, at this point, um, with a lot of these supercomputers, it's not the technology. Um, it's actually the software that runs on it. Right, uh, making, that's, that's part of it. Yeah, making use of the, uh, the processor speed. Um, that becomes the biggest challenge. And kind of the, the thing about this one particular test was not necessarily that this computer's processing power equals 1% of a human brain's uh, <laughs> processing capability over one second, um, but that maybe the software isn't quite up to snuff with... Well, uh, to, just to throw some more numbers out there, they were simulating 1.73 billion virtual neurons right. connected by 10.4 trillion synapses. Right. That's a lot. Right. Yeah. But the promising thing about this is not so much that... Well, I mean, they can do it. It's kind of a proof of concept. So the hope is right, right now we're kind of in the petascale, like I said, petaflop, the petascale generation of supercomputing. In the next 10 to 20 years, we'll be in the exascale, which will be 10 times that. Yeah, it's... And uh, at that point, they're hopeful that we could simulate the entire human brain. That's Moore's law and work, right? Yeah. Um, all right, why don't we uh, quickly jump to the uh, break video. Do you mind setting this up? Uh, yeah, we, uh, me and Chris, also known as Zion Villar, and uh, Mikey, who has his own video blog, we went together to a soccer game in South Osaka, Cerezo, Osaka. And I took a little bit of video of that. I'm, I'm not a very good sports videographer, but yeah. I did my best. Yeah, the bit just that to I... give you kind of a sense of what it was like to be there. Yeah, the bit that I saw looked pretty good. I'm surprised. I didn't know you went with, uh, with Chris and uh, Mikey. And a couple of the people. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, anyway, guys, uh, we've got a couple more stories on the other side of the break, so um, stick around. But in the meantime, enjoy this uh, video. See you guys in a bit. Bye-bye. Mikey. Hiya. And we just went to, well, a lot of our first soccer game in Japan. Cerezo Osaka versus Venvere Kofu. 
We lost, unfortunately, 1-0, but it was a fun time, and uh, I'm hoping to show you at least a little bit of that coming up next. Welcome back to the Bad Communication Netcast. Yeah, that was cool. Actually, I, I didn't notice the uh, the commuter rail kind of going just next to the uh, stadium. Oh, the Hanwha line? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. That's that's what makes uh, Kincho Stadium so great. Is it? You can watch you can watch Associated Association football and watch train <laughs> Yeah, for you train train nerds out there. That looked like a pretty good game actually. Uh, there's a lot of purple in the audience. Pink actually. Pink. What were they? Uh, pink, pink and pink and navy, what, what, kind of the Cerezo colors. What were they? Uh, what were they cheering at one point? I heard something, something Cerezo. <laughs> That's all I could pick up. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, anyway, as you said last week, I think uh, you said Cerezo lost 0-1, right? Yeah, 1-0. Oh wow, looks really cool, actually. Look at you. You're kind of out and about these days. Sports matches, Summer Sonic. Yeah, it's kind of a rarity. <laughs> All right. Um, Quite a bit of spirit, those sports fans, though. Yeah, yeah. It's like a good time. It's like just like a sports uh, sports event in sporting event in the United States as well, right? I've never, you know, I I've never been to a professional sports event in the USA, but really, I'm not aware of that kind of coordination in terms of cheering and uh, and drum beats and. Yeah, yeah. I guess like there's a lot of. Um, kind of set things that people do during sports events like um if you watch the uh, hunting tigers they of course they have their own song that everybody knows and there's always that really big uh, balloon release thing mm-hmm. um you, you've never been to a hunting tigers game have you not yet that's still on my list and seeing as i'm i'm living in the same city that that has the stadium now <laughs> really ought to go <clears throat> there's no excuse no excuse 
All right, guys, um, we've got two more stories. We're going to blow through these really quickly again. We want to keep this kind of short. Um, the next story coming up is uh, a little bit more about, uh, not supercomputers, but uh, robots. It comes to us via Japan Today um, and is about uh, robots teaching Japanese children calligraphy. Um, so uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about this story. I, I was more interested in kind of the debate that it inspired. So um, there's this uh, kind of traditional art form in Japanese called uh, shodo, which is uh, writing Chinese characters, kanji. Um, using a uh, fude, which is a brush, and it's on, uh, it's not, it's not rice paper, it's mulberry paper, I think. Um, it's a special paper that you use for calligraphy. And, you know. I'd always thought it was rice paper. Yeah, yeah, me too, until I read that comment at the bottom. Um, so, I mean, in addition to being a form of writing, which is actually used in Japan, it's also kind of an art form. So kind of very beautifully writing these strokes, um, these characters, is something that um, takes years, decades of practice. And, you know, um, there are even different nationally recognized levels uh, among, you know, people who practice, uh, you know, calligraphy. Uh, however, um, there is a, a robotic arm that was recently invented that um, will actually guide learners of calligraphy to, to draw these strokes. Um, and it's informed by a 90-year-old uh, calligraphy kind of master uh, I forgot his name. Let's see. Uh, Juho Sado. Um, <laughs> and he, because his name is Sado, you know he's, uh, he's probably pretty into... Uh, well, I guess... No, Shodo. Oh, anyway, uh, Juho Sado is a master calligrapher who kind of taught this robot um, how to teach other people who use the robot uh, how to uh, you know, draw these strokes, uh, draw these characters properly. So what it is, it's a robotic arm, and as you write the stroke, um, if you deviate from the master's teaching, uh, it will actually kind of gently correct you. And this is really cool, and this is pretty amazing, but the thing that was kind of interesting was the, uh, the conversation that sparked about whether or not this was actually a good thing or a bad thing, whether or not this was actually preserving the art form uh, or not. And I, you know, I read a bunch of the comments, and people are saying that this is just BS, um, but I kind of disagree. Um, I don't think this is meant to replace human calligraphy, I think it's just meant as a teaching tool. Um, mm. And as a teaching tool, I, I think it's, it's absolutely fine. I mean, that's how people learn. They learn from the masters. They learn from people who are better than them. Um, I don't know, do you have any differing opinions on this? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, if you I mean, read... It's, it's just like using one of those... Like, we've got technology now to help us learn. We've got devices with touch screens that you can use a stylus to write strokes in and get correction on. Right, right, right. So it shows you kind of the outline of the stroke and you... Uh, and you I mean, I guess people say, well, that's not calligraphy, that's just regular writing, but even so... Well, yeah, I, I, th I mean, obviously, I think it's a fine line, but again, in fact, I... This, then th this is even better because you've got it informed by a 90-year-old master calligrapher. Right. I mean, that's kind of the the thing... You've got a better teacher that's available to much more people. Right. That, that's what I identify as kind of being the value of this. You know, you can, instead of studying from somebody who might just be a decent calligrapher, you can actually learn from this robot who, again, has captured the motion of this master calligrapher just one time. Again, it is his performance just once. But, I mean, still, it's probably much better than anything you could find, you know, in your local community. And, I mean, I, I do understand that calligraphy has a very organic and human element to it. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that robots replace humans um, when it comes to the art form of calligraphy, but I think it's a great learning tool. Um, as you said, just like we use technology to learn to do other things that are uniquely human. Um, yeah, I see nothing wrong with this. Uh, anyway, guys, if you have any uh, kind of comments, uh, please uh, leave a comment below or uh, hit us up on email. Uh, what is it? What is our email address? Uh, bc.wanwan.fm. Really? Is it? I think that one works. Got badcompodcast at gmail.com. That one also works. <laughs> All right, uh, why don't we get to the last story, Andrew? Wrap up the show. Okay, the last story. The Japanese women have reclaimed the world's longest life expectancy, according to Motherboard Magazine? I think so. Motherboard.vice.com. Sort of. There's a bit of a caveat. So no one born last year is expected to live longer than... The lucky ladies who were born in Japan. With exception. With exception. This is the article. Because the health ministry data showed that girls born in Japan in 2012 could expect to live on average 86.41 to 86.41 years old, up from 85.90, 85.90 in 
in uh, 2011. Mm-hmm. In second place are as Icelandic men. Oh, wait, no, no, that's for the male category, sorry. <laughs> right, right. The so, longest-lived men in the world are Icelandic, expecting to live up to 80 point, almost 81 years, which is, wow, there's still quite a bit of a deficit there. I've always wondered, you six, know... Five to six years. I've always wondered why that is. I wonder if it's... Um, I mean, obviously, if, if men and women both live in the same country, it can't be... Well, I guess it could be social or economic. It can't be environmental. But, I mean, there's got to be some sort of, like, social or socioeconomic reason why Japanese women have the uh, highest life expectancy while Icelandic men have the highest life expectancy. Well, they say that the life expectancies have kind of, before the deficit used to be wider, but it's kind of lessened because more women have joined the workforce. The gap is closing, then. The gap is closing. I, I don't know, though. Um... I, I'm sure there's a million and one reasons that go, or kind of factors well, that being, go into Being a housewife life. could still be a lot of work. Yeah, you're around chemicals all day, perhaps? Uh, it could be lifestyle. I mean, a lot of men are lazy. More men, more men are smokers, I think. Yep. Yeah, more definitely. men drink alcohol. Yep. Partake in dangerous activities. A lot of that probably comes down to lifestyle. Statistically speaking. Um, but yeah, there were a few kind of exceptions to this. Well, Hong Kong was briefly number one because of the su- tsunami in 2011. Right. But now Japan is back. But as you were saying, there are kind of, there are a lot of, I mean, especially with any kind of statistic like this, there's always but. And uh, we, we can't really, we agree on how to measure life expectancy, but we can't agree on what constitute a, co- constitutes a country for another thing. Right, right. They they did talk about a few other exceptions, like um, Hong Kong. Well, yeah, I see. That's the thing is Hong Kong is a is a special administrative region of China. So Not is it its own country? country I mean, it's right. autonomous in a lot of ways, but... Um, Monaco was also on the list, <clears throat> but Monaco is a population of a little bit over 30,000, so that's right. uh, <clears throat> a little bit... Uh, yeah, the article points out saying it's, it's like using Aspen as a model for how American cities should yeah. be run. And they um, said in, in Monaco, they, women are estimated to live for an astounding 91 point, almost 94 years. Yeah, 93.71 years. I think Monaco also has the highest concentration of millionaires in the world. I wouldn't be surprised. I know there's quite a few casinos in Monaco. Well, yeah, see, that's just the thing is the more money you have, the more <clears throat> better medical treatment you get. Yeah, I mean, with a population of 30,500, yeah. And it, is, it raises kind of an interesting point, too. Um, it's only somewhat related, but um, the North Bay region of San Francisco Bay Area, uh, like Marin County, Sonoma, Napa, it has the highest, one of the highest rates of uh, diagnosed breast cancer in America. Really? And uh, people are wondering why. Is it something environmental up there? But uh, something that throws the statistic off is that North Bay is a pretty affluent area, you, which means the women there have more money, better health care treatment, access to, more access to doctors, which means they get diagnosed for these sort of things, whereas women in poorer areas don't. Yeah, I was about to say the kind of... So the rates are thrown off. The key word there would be diagnoses. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's the same thing like in, in Tokushima. Um, I think uh, Tokushima Prefecture has the highest uh, rate of diagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, adult onset diabetes. And a lot of people point to, to health factors, like, you know, Tokushima people don't necessarily eat as healthy as people in other prefectures for a number of reasons. They live somewhat more sedentary lives, despite it being the countryside. Um, but a lot of doctors in the area point to the uh, kind of methods of diagnosis. Um, in many cases, uh, diabetes is pointed to as, like, let's say, cause of death. Um, if the person is overweight, if they have elevated, uh, you know, blood sugar levels, for example, and they pass away because of a heart-related risk. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, it's always kind of complicated. It doesn't necessarily mean that diabetes is more prevalent in Tokushima, which it might be. Um, diagnos- uh, diagnosis techniques can also play a big role in that. Uh, anyway, uh, I think we've got to wrap up. So much for the short show, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, any last things you want to mention before we, uh, before we head out? I think that's about all. I don't. There's nothing big coming up, <laughs> is there? No, I don't think so. This month, with Are regards you, to bad communication. No, I mean it's the Obon holiday. But uh, besides that, I think same as usual next week, right? Yeah. 
All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for watching or listening to the Bad Communication Netcast. Uh, if you'd like to find our show notes with links to all of the articles we talked about today, you can find it on our blog, badcommunicationjapan.com. There's all sorts of contact information there as well. Hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, bad communication, sorry, badcompodcast at gmail.com. Anyway, all the information is up on the blog, so check it out. All right. So as always, um, we got to get the hell out of here for now. So once again, my name is Hiroki Matsuchi. I'm Andrew Hawkins. And uh, this is Bad Communication. Um, hey, have a great uh, Obon holiday to everybody who's living in Japan. And uh, hope you guys are surviving these summer heats to everybody living elsewhere in uh, hot climates. See you guys next week. Bye bye.